COVID-19 pandemic changed our lives. It has reshaped the way we use technology every day, from the way we work and learn and how we access services. Many of these changes are likely here to stay and we are yet to see the future impacts. My name is Belinda Esterhammer and I'm a tech strategist. The Heinrich Bell Foundation in Hong Kong invited me to explore what digital life looks like today. Since health concerns us all, let's begin with asking, what is the new normal in health tech? Health tech will, will, will be changed forever. People won't want to visit health facilities. Behaviors have changed. The bump in telemedicine has been felt all across the world. But I think the legacy of COVID will be you know, how you adopt your business models, your technology, your operation, really with a very different mindset. I think the new normal for the health tech industry is um, the prevalence of private public sector collaborations. So I think in the future, data sharing, being a very secure manner, can help unlock a lot more potentials. Before uh, COVID-19, people like to go to the doctor, consult the doctor face to face. But nowadays, because people want to avoid being infected, therefore they will try to have a distance with the doctor. This is so sad, but it is the reality. So in this case, I think the remote diagnosis will be the trend. As the population and the number of patients subsequently increase, automating diagnosis using artificial intelligence combined with remote monitoring, it's become an absolute necessity. Over the years, a lot of countries has actually lead as an example and show that how cities have more of a smart city solution embedded within, get less of an impact probably from COVID-19. So there would probably be a greater demand and need for smart city initiatives. I want to take a closer look at how these innovators in Asia contribute to fight the pandemic. Let's take a closer look at the stories. I'm Professor Larry Poon. I'm the CEO of Robon. Actually, our story starts from the love of robots. Uh, we all love robots, uh, my students and myself. And then uh, we built our first robot uh, two years ago. It's the first 5G humanoid robot in China. On January 23rd, Wuhan locked down the city and then Hong Kong alert. Hong Kong adopt a containment strategy to do the epidemic prevention. So one of the measures to help the epidemic prevention is the temperature control. So we think of a temperature control robots to help Hong Kong people. So what are some of your core technologies? Our core technology is the motion control humanoid robot means we can just pick up the sensors and then we move the sensors as a human and then the robot will mimic your action. We have uh, the epidemic prevention robot. About the robot can move around automatically. So just like you and me now we sit here but we don't have to queue up for the body temperature control. The robot can come to you and then screen, and then he got the temperature from you. And then that will be very effective and efficient. If we can do it, then we can help a lot of people to do the epidemic prevention. My name is Zhang Wei, and I'm the CEO of Accredify. Accreditify fundamentally, we take data to create verifiable documents. These verifiable documents are traceable, back to the source, and tamper-proof. So we started in the education sector, helping schools and professional institutes to issue things like diploma, degrees, transcripts, etc. We started our foray into the healthcare sector in April 2020. We started off with one of our first partner, SG Innovate, an agency in Singapore that does investments into early stage startups. We work with them to develop what we call a health passport. This is to allow medical institutes to issue verifiable healthcare records and for them to store it in a health passport for individuals to use it easily. And today uh, we are at September 2020 
and we're moving from discharge memos into COVID swap results and other documents going forward. How many um, COVID-19 related verifications have you processed so far? So far since April 2020, we have about 1.1 million verifications so far. And coming, going forward, as the economy opens up and allow more travels to happen, all the travellers that require to go across the borders will need a COVID swap as well, and they'll be verified. Apart from working with the Singapore government, you're already closely talking to other countries around the globe to use your solution. So what issues are governments facing when it comes to offering tech solutions to the public? So while we are working from Singapore, we see a need to have collaborators around the world. We face almost similar issues across the different countries and that is educating the public. So how can we get the message across to the citizens that our solution is secure, that their private data is protected, and that this solution is to help them to reopen the economy and enable cross-border travel faster. My name is Shadow, and I am the co-founder and chief software architect of ExpertFlow. Our company ExpertFlow, uh, it was founded in 2018 with the aim to revolutionize healthcare using uh, cutting edge technologies. And we classify ourselves in, as an AI powered healthcare startup. Using our technology, we are able to predict life threatening medical conditions before they actually occur uh, and uh, thereby potentially saving a lot of lives. So you aim to revolutionize healthcare through AI and deep tech. Can you please tell us more about your solutions? The core solution that we offer is called uh, Diagnostic, which is an AI-powered decision support system, and we are, which is our state-of-the-art biosensor. And uh, we use it to collect high-impact vital signs directly from the patient's wrist. So uh, this wearable, the end wear, it collects the data, which is then sent to our other device, which is called Nostro. And it is a machine learning computational device. It processes the data collected from anywhere and you know provides many hours of look ahead of a patient's medical condition based on uh, his or her historical data. And all of this can be viewed on a very intuitive dashboard that we just recently developed, which is called the NView. What does COVID-19 and sepsis have in common? But uh, you know, one of the most common causes of sepsis is uh, pneumonia, which is basically the infection of the lungs. Since COVID-19 in most cases directly targets and attacks the uh, lungs, this may uh, you know, activate and the overreactive immune response of the human body to pneumonia, uh, causing the patients to go in the state of septic amia. So you know, by preventing pulmonary infection, the chance of occurrence of sepsis you know, can be reduced in significant proportions. Can you please talk us through your timeline of what happened um, to expert flow um, when COVID-19 spread across the world and how many cases of sepsis you've already detected? As soon as the pandemic happened, we ramped up a focus on uh, fighting COVID-19 and uh, within three months of time, we were able to develop the first prototype of Cambria. We tested our device on a cohort of 1,000 patients and uh, we also obtained a test data set of 40,000 patients in the US and uh, we were able to significantly lower down the mortality rate of 45 percent that we said it in the test data set to 25 percent uh, when we uh, when we observed it through deep diagnostics so uh, the length of stay and the total time required to predict sepsis was significantly lower down and this is just a beginning um, working day and night to obtain more data the more data we obtain the more uh, accurate, accuracy we will be able to achieve in the coming years and the more lives we will be potentially able to save. My name is Alec. I am the Vice President Sales and Marketing of Time Medical Systems. Time Medical is a 
global medical imaging company. Our core business actually was MRI system. The recently, in three years ago, we started to think of uh, expanding our business. And we thought that sterilization robot or disinfection robot may be a good approach. So we co-work and co-develop with uh, robotic companies in China, optimized the robots in two, three years, and we got the certifications. Uh, so it's a medical grade robot. How does the robot actually work? The intelligent sterilization robot, uh, we got different features. It has a navigation system. Uh, so when there are some people or obstacle in front, it will calculate and reroute. So we have the vaporization nozzles that can spray the disinfectant 360 degrees and the spray disinfectant will reach uh, about 3.5 meters. Uh, with the UVC light, it can kill the bacteria and virus on the surface in the air in less than a minute. Can you please tell us more in detail about how the ISI is being used across Hong Kong? In early February, the pandemic started to come to Hong Kong. There was a, a, an outbreak in a cruise in Japan, the Diamond Princess. The Hong Kong government decided to send few chartered flights to send those uh, non-infected passengers back to Hong Kong. The Hong Kong International Airport was uh, uh, asking us to see what we can help uh, for them to prevent the outbreak in the airport because all those are high-risk groups. They uh, assigned a dedicated bathroom for the passengers returned from the chartered flights from Diamond Princess. We send the robot inside so it won't have any human contact and we use the robot for disinfection which can help to reduce over 90% or even 95% of uh, the bacterial environment. That's how we started when Asia World Expo was assigned as the Grand Time facilities. They also uh, bought few robots from us. So the public hospitals and private hospitals are also using the ISR. That really can help them a lot in minimizing the risk of cross-infection or hospital-associated uh, disease. Because of the outbreaks in the wet markets, especially for those with high risk and a lot of infected case markets, that we send the robot to the wet market for disinfection as well. Hello, my name is Zell and I'm the founder of ARX Media Malaysia. My company is uh, ARX Media. Uh, we are a company that specializes in IT, providing IT solutions, uh, specializing in augmented reality, virtual reality, smart city initiatives, and anything, re anything related to uh, advanced tech uh, for everybody. Can you talk us through the timeline of how you know, your company accelerated um, your offering and also your projects? Last year, we were actually doing a few um, pitches and a few plannings uh, with some of our local authorities on smart city, smart councils, smart parking, smart governance, smart payment. Uh, all this has been uh, within the pipeline. And when Malaysia was hit really badly, uh, midst of um, March, we strategized um, a solution that actually would you know, would, would be able to help the government to keep track of the movement of people in helping them with the patient investigation. Can you tell us a bit more about this app? I believe that the world has been thinking really, really hard on what kind of a solution may probably best fit to help reduce the impact uh, at a local level uh, to not give so big a social impact. We embark upon this journey to build the unified database for our local state. It was a concept that wants um, visitors to a premise to actually log in their check-in information. So we came up with a, a, a solution that allows users to log in their check-in data within a unified database so that local health authorities can actually gain access to this uh, information when they're required to do patient investigation. So it's a very simple concept of just scanning a QR code 
keying in your temperature and then uh, it will lock your information as all the informations are already being verified and validated from the very beginning. How many users have you had so far? To date, uh, we have uh, close to 500,000 users. How are you keeping all this information safe? Data security is always a concern uh, when it comes to uh, keeping a very big database. So one of the ways for not letting people find where our database is, is we hide it properly, securely. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of safety protocols around it so that we ensure that um, only uh, designated people can get access to it. So that way, uh, there will not be much of a security breach. And uh, that way, it also builds uh, confidence in our, our users, knowing that uh, people can, cannot get their hands on this data you know, through fraudulent methods. My name is Keith Diawis. I'm co-founding COO of ODOC. So ODOC is a telemedicine virtual care business. We essentially connect um, people and businesses to doctors over the internet and over an app. We also offer supplementary health services like medicine delivery, um, and like mobile lab diagnostics. Can you please talk us through the timeline of ODOC's pivot after COVID-19 spread across the world? COVID was a game changer for all parts of our business. When COVID struck or the first community transmission started in March um, and everyone was basically forced to stay at home, the only way for, for anybody across, across the country to speak to a doctor was to either ring a doctor they knew um, but increasingly um, use a virtual care provider. Um, so almost overnight, um, we started seeing huge traction. We went from probably 20 to 30 consults a day, which, which was our steady state prior to COVID, to you know probably well over 250 um, at the peak of COVID. So we saw exponential growth. We added 250 doctors onto our platform in that time. What we found was doctors would just stop seeing patients. People stopped who couldn't go to, to physical clinics and GP centres. So doctors' incomes and livelihoods also were impacted. So the only way for doctors really were to, to speak to their, to their patients was a telephone call, but actually to speak to someone and see someone um, was to use one of our services. Thank you. Can you please tell us more about how you work with the government? We tied up with the government in the early days of COVID. We essentially run the government's telemedicine line what that means is uh, anyone within the country can consult with a government doctor for free at any time using the ODOC app. It was a, a great tie up for both the people of Sri Lanka in that they got free virtual care and quality virtual care, but also for us. What issues are governments facing when it comes to offering tech solutions to the public? I think adoption of you know, government sponsored technology is and platforms is the biggest challenge. We work in markets in South Asia where smartphone, smartphone penetration is still low, literacy rates in some of our neighboring countries are still low. So it's not just a question of rolling out technology, it's also educating the consumers. So when a government launches a technology platform, typically in these markets, there has to be a huge amount of sort of ATL, sort of local education, both in kind of traditional kind of um, press uh, and mediums um, to educate um, the mass market on how you use technology and how particularly you use these new platforms. What are your predictions for the health tech industry post COVID-19? So I think they will be huge innovations in areas like AI, like robotics, like virtual um, diagnose, diagnostics and obviously virtual care where we, where we operate in. Um, I think a huge amount of capital will be deployed across health tech, but I think those are the areas that will really have to innovate um, post-COVID. The pandemic is far from over and the impact on our lives is here to stay. One important question remains, how will we use technology in the future? Technology is, is just a terminology that describes uh, things that are advanced, you know. How we use it, it's more on the innovation side. More and more solutions will be more convenient for people and because ultimately uh, technology is here to serve and I believe it's to serve people, to make people more efficient, make people safer, 
COVID-19 has a big impact to people's behavior. Before, maybe some people, they are reluctant to change, resist to change. But now, given the COVID-19, it forced us to do it. A you know, huge decentralization of people. People are living in different, you know, out of the core cities. Um, and I think the you know, adaptation of technology to work from home, to collaborate, probably there's been more behavioral change in the last six months than there had been in the last you know, four or five years. And that's not just from data savvy people. General consumers would ha have had to adopt new technology to live their lives and, and both personal lives and, and professional lives. Thank you for watching. Look out for our videos on technology trends, on education, travel and social impact.